know, as I read your book, it seems to me that it it causes you to kind of go through a, a mental shift which is, is quite consequential. One from yeah. seeing the world as made up of objects, which right. seems to be a natural way to, to think of things, like there you are sitting yeah. in a chair as, yes. as an object, rather than understanding the world as a process, like this yes. conversation. That's right. Also, a shift from objects to relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is apparent when we look at the world today, and you know, I, I come to the, the social dimension, which is mm -hmm. not a main theme of this book, but yeah. it's still very important, and I actually begin the book with that. Mm -hmm. When we come to our, our you know, social and political situation, we see that, that most of the problems that we have in the world today uh, come from the fact that we see things in a fragmented way, mm -hmm. that we are unable to focus on the relationships among things. Take ecology, for instance. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons why we are destroying the very environment on which our livelihood depends uh, is that we really don't understand ecosystems well enough. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't. And we don't understand them well enough because in order to do so, you need to know something about ecology, which is basically a science of relationships. Yeah. Ecology is the science that deals with the relationships among all the members in the earth household. That's the original word in Greek. Oikos means household. Ah. So ecology is the science of the earth household, more precisely the science of how everything is interrelated in the earth household. Mm -hmm. And so when we disregard that, then we do a lot of damage to ourselves. And so we have to learn to shift from a perception of objects to a perception of relationships. And as you said before, also to a perception of processes. Mm -hmm. so, so you have objects, relationships, and processes. And those are the shifts that, mm -hmm. that are now going on. Now, one of the interesting distinctions that you make is the distinction between the systems approach, this relational approach, and what used to be called in uh, biology a vitalist approach to right. understanding life. Right. Well, when I when I uh, tried to put together the various theories mm -hmm. that have been proposed in the last 20, 25 years, uh, which are very different from the older systems theories, and I'll come back to that later, mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh, when I tried to put those together, I was forced to really study the history of systems thinking yeah. and to see how it began to be developed, how it emerged during the 1920s. And there was a very interesting discussion between the old school mechanists mm -hmm. who came straight from Descartes, seeing the world as a machine, animals as machines, even the human body as a machine, and then the so-called vitalists. And the vitalists said that the mechanistic view, in other words, to describe and understand life on the basis of the laws of physics and chemistry is not enough. Mm -hmm. And they said you will never understand life if you just stick to physics and chemistry. You need something uh, on top of it and that something else is a vital force or mm -hmm. a vital field. Mm -hmm. It's a non-material entity that is outside the material phenomena and, and gives it the spark of life, so mm -hmm. to speak. And the systems thinkers emerged from that debate and the systems thinkers then said they disagreed with both sides. They mm -hmm. said the laws of physics and chemistry are not enough. But you don't need anything from the outside. You don't need any non-material entity. What you need to understand is the organization mm -hmm. of, of uh, living matter. They called it the organizing relations. Mm -hmm. So an understanding of relationships. But these relationships are inherent in living matter. They are embedded in it. So you don't need to go outside to mm -hmm. seek for a vital force. Just understanding the relationships, the form, the patterns of organization. And out of that came the systems mm -hmm. theories. Basically, the idea is is that rather than a new force in, in nature, an elan vital, I think, was right, the, the right. term that uh, the Bergson philosopher used, yeah. Henri Bergson yeah. used, you, you look at uh, an e a property that emerges when you put together a, a very complex whole, that, that the whole itself is more than the sum of its parts. Right, right. And, and that was actually the sort of um, starting point uh, this famous phrase that was coined by the first systems thinkers, um, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, people ask themselves, what does it mean, mm -hmm. actually? What does it mean concretely? What do we have to add to the parts 
to get a living whole. Mm -hmm. And there the vitalist said, you know, the vital force, and, and the systems thinker said, no, an understanding of relationships. That's mm -hmm. what you have to add. Mm -hmm. So would, would you say, though, that, that the idea of a vital force is, is one that uh, you reject yourself? Yes. You yes, do. absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and, and again, uh, it was very good for me mm -hmm. to go through this history of systems thinking, yeah. to research it carefully. And, and as you know, the whole first part of the book is, gives this history of yes. systems thinking through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, up, up to the 80s. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine is Rupert Sheldrake. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ha he's a vitalist. And, and I could never understand how his ideas would fit into systems thinking, yeah. did they or mm -hmm. didn't they? Rupert Sheldrake, we should say, is a British biologist right. who has developed the theory of the morphogenic fields, right. which is like a vital force, exactly. a, a exactly. non-physical organizing right. principle. Right, and it took me a while to really understand that those are two different views, his mm -hmm. and mine, and he's a representative of the vitalist school and I'm a representative mm -hmm. of the systems school. So I, I guess it's fair to say that uh, both schools are alive and well. And well, that's right. Uh -huh. yes. And from the point of view of the system school, you're, you're in effect um, more consistent with materialist philosophy and, and the idea of life and consciousness e emerging as an epiphenomenon. Uh, well, this, we get into dangerous territory okay. here. You have to be very careful with how you use your words here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting because we, we have the tendency to sort of say things lightly or in the traditional way. Yes. And I agree with part of your sentence, but mm -hmm. only, only with part. Mm -hmm. What happens is that uh, I, I need to talk a little bit about the nature of the synthesis that I developed. Okay. What I discovered going through the history of, of systems thinking was that you can say that there are two approaches to understanding nature which have been in competition with one another throughout the history of Western philosophy and science. And one approach starts with the question, what is it made of? And that was the dominant approach. Yeah. You take things to pieces, you study basic building blocks, uh, components, uh, elements, and so on. So in this approach, you study matter, you study quantities, structures, and so on. The other approach does not start with the question, what is it made of? but asks what is the pattern mm -hmm. and when you study the pattern you study relationships you study qualities you study organization and my uh, synthesis really consists in putting those two together because when you when you want to understand life you need both mm -hmm. you need uh, need to understand you know the dna the macromolecules and and all the molecular biology but you also need to understand the patterns of life and how things are related. And it turns out when you go into some detail of how to synthesize those two, that you need a third one. Mm -hmm. And the third one is the process dimension. You need to understand the process of life. And so in this synthesis, I have three uh, perspectives on life. You could call them three conceptual dimensions. And one is the structure dimension, one is the pattern dimension, uh, and the third is the process dimension. Mm -hmm. When you look at those three, <coughs> only one of the three is material, yeah. the structure dimension. You see, mm -hmm. a pattern is not uh, something material, it's mm -hmm. a set of relationships. Mm -hmm. Process is not something material. So, so if I were to say to what extend is my view materialistic, I would say 33.3 percent. You know, it's a third, <laughs> uh -huh. a third of the synthesis. I see. So it's not a materialistic view. Mm -hmm. However, I do believe that mind and consciousness emerge from matter at a certain level of complexity. Mm -hmm. And the organization becomes such that the processes involved and the patterns involved are those we associate with life, mm -hmm. with living systems. One of the fundamental ideas that led to the development of systems theory, as I understand it, is cybernetics. And, That's and, right. And the yes. uh, basic concept of the feedback loop. Right. Which, which I yes. presume, and it's not quite clear to me, but I, I gather that this idea of the feedback loop is, is fundamental also to understanding consciousness. Um, yes, yes it is, to understanding life as a whole. Mm -hmm. Let me first say uh, that one should not jump to consciousness without understanding life. Because mm -hmm. consciousness is a phenomenon, at least I believe that, yes. is a phenomenon associated with life. Mm -hmm. You cannot, I, as you know, I'm a trained physicist. Mm -hmm. And there are many physicists today who attempt to understand consciousness on the basis of quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And I think they're all 
uh, on you know following a wrong road mm -hmm. because consciousness is associated with life and so uh, coming back to feedback uh, the question of feedback is very important because when you ask what is the pattern of life then one of the great breakthroughs in the early days of, of systems thinking uh, was to see that life is always networks. Whenever you have living systems, you have networks, networks of relationships. Yeah. So the basic pattern of life is networks. But not every network is a living system, as we well know. So what is characteristic of the living networks? And feedback is one of the key characteristics of living networks. In a living network, you can have an influence that goes from one node to the network, to another, to another, and then comes back and feeds back the effect into the origin. Mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, living networks can correct themselves. It's just maybe the easiest to see this is to think of a community. When we work or live in a community and say we do something uh, that is wrong either technically or strategically or morally or whatever, when we make a mistake, uh, then if the community is really a network of communication, very soon the news will get back to us and say, hey, you know, you goofed here, you did something wrong, then we can correct. Yes. So because of feedback, a community can correct itself. And that is true for all living systems. Mm -hmm. Living systems can correct themselves. Repeated self-correction leads to self-regulation and self-organization. Mm -hmm. So living systems organize themselves because they have this mm -hmm. feedback built into the living network. Mm -hmm.